I'm reading from Luke 11, verses 1 to 13. And in my Bible, the heading is the Lord's Prayer. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his... Im <laughs> I'm sorry, this word has struggled me all day. Um, impotence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I, will, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and for the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Thanks so much, Janine. Morning, everyone. Let's pray. Yeah, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is living and active. We thank you, Lord, that these weren't just your words to your disciples 2,000 years ago. Lord, they're your words to us here this morning. Lord, we need you to teach us how to pray. We need your help and your instruction. And the good news for us this morning is that you are willing to give us both of those things in abundant measure. And so, Lord, we just pray, give us ears to hear you this morning and eyes to see and soft hearts to receive. And would you increase our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, one of the things that I think children are best at is asking yeah children put no limits upon their asking or at least very young children you know can i have an ice cream no it's 10 o'clock in the morning you know can i stay up late no you've got school tomorrow can i have a unicorn no they don't exist you know but the younger they are the more outrageous their requests are and the more forthcoming they are about asking for things but what i've noticed is as kids get older a couple of things start to happen. Number one, they begin to get more independent. And as they get more independent, they begin to want to obviously do more things themselves. And so they stop asking as much for help because they want to be able to do it themselves. You know, they want to call the shots. And so you kind of say, do you need help with that? And they say, no, 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 I've, I've got it. I can do it. But the other thing that happens is they also become more hesitant in their asking. And often the reason they become more hesitant is their hesitation is born out of disappointment. Yeah, it's born out of a fear of being disappointed. And so sometimes you'll have, you know, one of our kids will come up and, and they'll, they'll want to ask you something, you know, if they can do something or if they can have something. But rather than just come in and asking outright like they would have done when they were a very small child, they're hesitant. You know, you kind of, they just hang around. They, they don't even, you know, say the words or they start to ask. They go, oh, can I? Oh, no, I won't ask because you're just going to say no. It's like they're hedging their bets. You know, they kind of, I don't want to ask because I... And dis I, I'm worried about being disappointed that you might say no. And so as a parent, you try to, to draw out their requests. And often you know the thing that they, that they want, and actually you want them to, to ask you for it. You could just give it, but you want them to, to ask you. You say, no, go on, you need, you need to ask, yeah? And if you're a mean parent, you don't say no anyway, but no. And, and so then you joyfully give them what it is that they are wanting to ask. Now, I think the same issue often affects us when it comes to praying 
and when it comes to asking things from God. There is no doubt in the scripture that Janine just read so wonderfully well um, that Jesus encourages us to ask. Yeah, you can't, you can't read that little section and come away from that scripture with any doubt in your heart or mind that Jesus is encouraging us to ask. Just a couple of things, just as we kind of get into the passage. So in verse 3 in the Lord's Prayer, give us each day our daily bread. The disciples have come, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus, in one of the first things that he says is, give us, you pray like this, give us each day our daily bread. Now, Luke's version of Jesus' prayer here is a bit more pithy, a bit more kind of shortened than his version in, in Matthew. And so in Luke's version, this call, this prayer, this part of the prayer, give us each day our daily bread, is in the is right smack bang in the middle of the prayer. It's it's there, it's central. Okay, and what's really interesting is, you know, in the middle of this prayer, which is kind of um cosmic, you know, in terms of calling on God's kingdom to come. It's reverent in terms of asking God's name to be hallowed. It's spiritual in terms of, um, you know, seeking um, to, to, to not be led into temptation. It's contrite in terms of asking for God's forgiveness. In, in the midst of all these different elements of this prayer, right in the heart of it, there's this very earthy, direct simple request, which is give us each day our daily bread. And then in verse 5 to 8, Jesus goes on to tell a parable about a man knocking on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night asking for bread. So he's telling a parable, the point of it being about asking God for stuff. And then if we're a little bit slow on the uptake, he then brings a bit of teaching at the end in the last few verses, which is all about asking the Father for things. So we see on a very simple reading of this passage that asking is right at the center. This is the thing that in this moment Jesus is wanting to emphasize to his disciples. And yet, even though it's explicit, I think if we're honest, often we have a strange or mixed experience when it comes to asking God for things. We probably fall in a few different camps at different times. So maybe we ask a lot, but we don't see many answers. And maybe the reason that we don't see many answers is because actually, if we're honest, we're asking for things with the wrong heart. Or maybe we only tend to ask for big things you know, crisis moments, that's when we'll turn to prayer, that's when we'll ask God for things, but we won't ask him for things in the everyday. Or maybe, and this is where I think a lot of us sometimes fall, is that actually we've kind of got out of the habit of asking because we've become disappointed or disillusioned or because we're not full of faith that God is going to either hear or that he's going to act. And I really believe this morning that the Father wants to Extend that fresh invitation to us all this morning to ask him, to ask him for things, to come as his children with expectation and with faith and ask him for things. And today we're going to just look at two things. We look at two reasons why we should persist in asking prayer. Number one is that asking reminds us of the Father's heart. And number two, asking helps us to let go. So let's think about the first of those then. Asking reminds us of the Father's heart. Let me just ask you, when you picture God's face, and obviously in in some senses the Father doesn't have a face, uh, although Jesus has a human face, but when you picture God's countenance, how, how does it appear in your mind's eye? How does he appear in your imagination? Just think about that for a moment. When you come to him in prayer, when you come to him to ask him of things, how does he look upon you? Is he warm? Is he open? Is he welcoming? Is he generous? Does he have a big smile on his face and open arms? Is that how you and experience him when you come to him? Or actually, do you see him as stern 
or stingy or reluctant or irritated. Yeah, Maybe you perceive God to be volatile. So he is good and he is loving, but you've got to catch him on the right day. And if you catch him on the wrong day, then actually you don't want to go near. Now, our perception of God as our Father will often be shaped and informed by our experiences of our own earthly fathers. And so it's really helpful to be able to see how we are influenced in our thinking about God as our Father and whether that, whether that perspective is shaped more by our earthly experiences or by the revelation of God as a Father that we read in the Scriptures. Because without realizing it, often we bring our own personal kind of baggage to God when we come to him in prayer in terms of how we view him. But the reality is our view of the Father yeah, will shape the way that we pray. Our view of the Father will shape how we ask and what we ask for. And again, Jesus couldn't have been any clearer, I think, in the passage that we've just read in Luke about the Father's heart. Yeah, so he begins when the disciples say, teach us how to pray by saying, okay, the first thing that you say is Father. That's, that's the, the description, yeah, that we, we come to when we come to pray. Father, he could have said, come and say, Lord, Lord of hosts, God Almighty. He could have given lots of other descriptions that we read of about God in the Old Testament. But the one that Jesus chooses is an intimate expression of relationship. He says, when you come, pray, Father. So immediately there, he's, he's putting us into a context in terms of our prayers of intimate relationship. What he's actually doing is he's inviting us to, to speak to God in the way that Jesus spoke to the Father. He's saying, this is how I pray. I pray our Father. This is how I communicate with the Father whom I've been in perfect loving union with for all of eternity. And I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you to come and speak to the Father in the same way that I, the Son, speak to the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty amazing. <laughs> That that's the first thing that he says. That's how he wants to couch their approach. You say, our Father. And then he tells them the parable. Let's just um, remind ourselves of it in verses uh, 5 to 8. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Now, if we're not careful, we can read this parable and actually misunderstand what Jesus is doing. It'd be easy to read this and go, okay, so I'm like the friend who comes and asks God for bread, and God's like the other friend who's quite grumpy in bed and doesn't want to get up, but will reluctantly give me what I ask if I keep nagging him. Yeah? And so we can kind of go, okay, this is how this parable works out. And if we do that, we've totally missed the point because what Jesus is doing here, he's not drawing a parallel between the friend who gives the bread and God. He's drawing a contrast. Yeah, he's saying the friend yeah, was a bit grumpy and couldn't be bothered to get up to give him his friend bread, but he did. Okay? And if he did, how much more? <laughs> right? And he even says that when he's talking about the father later on. How much more will the father give to those who ask him? So it's not a parallel, it's a contrast. Now, Jesus does the same thing in Luke 18 when he's talking about the parable of the persistent widow, right? Yeah, the widow who goes to the unjust judge and says, give me justice, and the judge isn't interested in the widow's cause or case at all, and yet eventually he does give her justice because he says, oh, because she just keeps nagging me, I will. I don't care about her situation, I don't care about her at all, but because she keeps nagging and she keeps coming, okay, I will do that. And Jesus does exactly Exactly the same. He says, look, if the unjust judge responds to the woman he doesn't care about at all, but she keeps coming, how much more will the loving father who does care about your situation, 
who does want justice for you, respond to your prayers. But what's interesting is in Luke 18, the emphasis is very much on persistence, yeah? Persistence and persevering in prayer. And in fact, Luke even sets it up by saying, Jesus taught them this parable so that they might always pray and never lose heart. Which again, as an aside, is amazingly encouraging because it means that Jesus knew we'd be pretty rubbish at prayer. <laughs> you know, he knew that we would struggle, that we would find it difficult if we didn't get instant answers, and that we'd need a story to help us know and be encouraged that we should continue to persevere and that God is faithful in his answering. But the emphasis in this parable is a little bit different, and it's all built upon this strange word that Janine understandably struggles to, to, to pronounce, which is impudence. Okay, And it, it's, it carries a sense of perseverance, but it actually carries something a little bit more than that. It, it kind of speaks of shameless audacity. You know, it's almost like cheeky boldness. <laughs> that's, the, that's the sense, yeah? And Jesus is saying, look, the friend, because he was a friend, yeah, came in the middle of the night and asked for bread, and he, he, was, he was kind of being audacious. He was kind of being cheeky, and, and the guy responded reluctantly. But you have a heavenly father who invites you to come and ask audacious things of him, who actually says, you know what? Be a bit, be a bit cheeky. You know, when kids ask you, you know, for like, again, can I have ice cream in the morning or can I stay up late? There's, there's a security in asking for that thing that's a little bit outrageous because I'm secure in the love of my parents. So even if they say no, I know it's for my, my own good. But there's a sense of invitation from Jesus saying, look, when you pray, when you ask for things, you don't just have to ask for the polite little things that you feel like it's okay to ask for. You can actually come audaciously. You could come with that sense of cheeky boldness in your asking. And if the grumpy friend will eventually respond, how much more willing will your heavenly father be to give it to you? And again, just to hammer home the point, in case we miss it, Jesus then goes on to say this in verse 9, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Jesus' point is, you can come to the Father and ask anytime and about anything, and he will respond to you. You can figuratively knock on the door of the Father's house anytime and ask for anything and he will open the door to you. Now when we think about, if you're a parent here, your parental responses to your children when they ask you for outrageous things, yeah, there's a few reasons why we might not give them what they ask. The first is because what they're actually asking for isn't going to be good for them. And they don't understand it because they don't have that perspective. But they're driven by a desire. But we as parents know a little better. And so we go, I'm, I'm going to say no to the ice cream at 10 a.m. in the morning, right? Because that's probably not going to be great for you, right? Sometimes we might say yes if we're feeling particularly outrageously generous. But generally, we say no to the things that we know aren't going to be good for them. But there are two other reasons that we might say no as parents. The first, actually, is because we're not always generous. We're, not, we're, we're sometimes stingy as parents. We're sometimes hard-hearted as parents towards our children. If our children have misbehaved, yeah, and then they ask for something. You ever had that if the parents here where your children have just been a bit, a bit tricky all day, and then at the end of the day they ask for something, and your response is, are you serious? You have behaved in this way all day, and now you're asking if you can do this. And so almost our giving is based upon their behavior, and then the other reason that we might say no to them is because we have a lack of resources. You know, can we go to Wembley and watch the football? Well, no, actually, because we can't really afford it. You know, can we go on holiday to Australia? Well, no, because we can't afford it. Like, we are limited in our ability to be able to respond positively to their resources. But when we think about the Father, 
and how he responds to us in our asking, we suddenly realize that actually he's never not generous. He does say no sometimes because he knows what's better for us, but he's never not generous. He doesn't just give in response to our righteousness because otherwise we'd never receive anything. And he's not limited in his resources to be able to give us what we ask for. And so again, that's how God is different from us. And so again, when we think about how Jesus encourages us to ask and this parable, you know, it's not an accident that Jesus teaches the disciples to pray, give us our daily bread, yeah? And then in the parable, the man comes along and says to me, give me, lend me three loaves. Give me bread. Yeah, Jesus says, I want you to pray this way. Give me bread. And then he tells a parable of a guy who knocks on a guy's door and says, give me bread. Yeah, so his point is, you can ask plainly. You can ask simply. You don't have to flower it up. You don't have to find eloquent words to really persuade God. So he goes, wow, you've asked me in such an impressive way because you've done it that way. I am more inclined to give to you. No, we can ask simply, Lord, give me bread. Lord, give me bread. It's a straightforward prayer. Sometimes we wrestle and we struggle with that because we think, I can't just come and bring my needs to God. And we've probably all heard, and I've probably said it from the front, we shouldn't treat God like a vending machine and we shouldn't just come with our shopping list. And obviously, if these are the only ways that we interact with the Father outside of the context of relationship and intimacy, that's where the asking becomes problematic. But in the context, the right context is, I'm your son, you're my father. You said, come and ask me. We can come and ask. And we don't have to find the right formula. John Mark Homer says, God is not a formula. He is a friend. So when it comes to asking, it's not I've got to find the right word or I've got to put my business case before God and convince him why he should give me these things or I've got to behave in a certain way and act righteously and then God will reward me when I ask No, he just says, ask, ask, and it will be given to you. So we can ask him for things directly. We can ask him for anything. And we don't just have to limit our asking to big things. Daily bread is deliberately small. And it's daily bread. Yeah, it's not weekly bread. You know, it's not, Lord, can I have bread that I can stick in the freezer and then I'll come back to you in two weeks' time when I need some more bread, you know, in that culture and context, you couldn't preserve your bread. You needed daily bread. If you were going to eat, you needed to to get bread daily. The whole point is an invitation into consistent and constant asking of the everyday things, the everyday things that you need to live and nourish and grow. It's a small prayer. See, the problem is if we only ever pray the big prayers, that we can't ever measure really whether God has answered. The, the world kind of peace prayers, which are great. We should pray for the nations. okay? But if we then don't invite God to intervene and be involved in the small things of our every day, we will miss seeing God's hand at work in our lives because he wants to be involved in the every day. And when you ask God for small things and God faithfully answers, then what that does is it cultivates gratitude in our hearts. It cultivates thankfulness because we're constantly asking and then we're constantly recognizing how God is moving, how God is responding, how God is present with us in our day-to-day. And then it draws us into a deeper intimacy and experience of the Father's heart. If you want to grow in knowing the Father's heart for you, grow in knowing his love for you, you've got to kind of step out and take the risk of asking him, you know, to to risk the disappointment and then be able to process that. But alongside that, you'll experience the graciousness and goodness of God and his loving father heart towards you. So asking prayer reminds ourselves and brings us into an experience of the father's heart. That's the first benefit. Secondly, 
asking prayer helps us to let go. Okay, so the second benefit of asking is that every time we ask, we wage war against one of the great enemies of our souls, which is control. Yeah? This is an issue that humanity has wrestled with and struggled for since the fall. You know, this is one of the drivers and motivators behind Adam and Eve's sin is that sense of like, we want to be in control. We want to make the decisions about what we can and can't do. We want to be God. And it's something that we all at times wrestle with. And again, you see this in children, as I said at the start. You know, that sense is as children grow, they grow in that sense of, I don't want to be dependent upon you. And obviously in the sense of a child, that's a positive thing as well. But often they try to overstretch themselves before they're able to do the things that they can do. And so, you know, you see your, your young child carrying the six pinter of milk, trying to pour it into the cereal. And you say to them, would you like some help with that? Like, it looks like that's a task that's slightly beyond your capability abilities and yet there's this kind of independence this desire to be able to do it on their own it says no no I've got this don't worry I've got this and then inevitably what happens is the milk spills all over the floor and you kind of in a loving way go yeah you didn't quite didn't quite have that and yet when we don't pray when we don't ask the father for things what we're basically saying to God is it's all right God I've got this I've got this I know you can help me. I know you could help me. But no, no, it's fine. I've got this. And I wonder if how many of our milk all over the floor moments in life come about because we were living with a mindset of, so I've got this. Don't need your, don't need your help in this. I can manage this one on my own. You see, I think a lot of us, um, actually, if we were to, peel back the layers of our heart, live our lives pretty exhausted and pretty stressed out and pretty emotionally uh, weary because we expend so much of our energy in life just trying to keep all of the plates spinning. The plates of work, the plates of family, the plates of church, the plates of finances, the plates of, plates of relationship, the plates of health. And we're just like, you ever seen those, those plate spinning um, shows? Oh, shows, no one goes to a plate spinning show, but you know what I mean? Like act, that's the word I'm looking for. Hey, do you want to go watch plate spinning stuff? But no, you know, that like royal variety show, kind of, you know, like guys spinning the plates. Um, and they're just like, you know, they start off with the one plate and then they move to the second one and then they move to the third one and they have to run back to the first one and they're spinning again and then they put another one on. And it's just so stressful to watch, isn't it? And they're just like, by the end of it, like running backwards and forwards, like sweat pouring down, just trying to keep all of these plates in the air. And yet a lot of the time we live our lives like that. And yet I've also seen that act where um, somebody does it and they start spinning the plate and uh, they look surprisingly relaxed. And then they kind of move on to the next one and spin the plate and you know, go back to the other one. But just do, they're not rushing. They're just, you know, they've got it in control. And you think, wow, this guy, you know, he's not worried at all that these plates are going to fall. And then he kind of moves on to the next one and moves on to the next one. And he kind of finishes his act with all of the plates kind of spinning on the sticks and kind of takes a bow and walks off. But then as he walks off the stage, he goes and he picks up all the sticks and you find all the plates actually held on by string and they're just kind of hanging. They're not really, he's not really spinning them. And the point is that however much you rush around and try and keep all the plates in the air, the reality is you're not holding them anyway. You're not holding them anyway. You're not in control. Any sense of control that you have over life is just an illusion. God is the one who's holding the plates. And so we need to learn to entrust those things that are most important to us into his hands. But often our lack of asking flows from that place that deep down we are not willing to entrust him with those things that are most important to us. We want to keep the plates spinning ourselves. And I wonder if you ever had that thing where you, you, you've really wanted something, okay, and you've thought about, praying about it to God, but you've kind of thought, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to ask God for this just in case he gives me the opposite. You know, like I really long for this thing to happen, but I'm, I'm not going to give it to God just in case 
He sees that and goes, aha, growth opportunity. I'm going to give you exactly the opposite of the thing in your heart that you really want. And again, I think the encouragement from this passage is that Jesus knows, okay, that that's sometimes how our brains and our hearts go, that we're going to struggle to believe that God is the good father that he really is. And so he says this in verse 11, what father among you? If his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? I mean, we're, we're so familiar with this illustration, right? But, but just actually think about it. It's hilarious. This is Jesus being funny, right? It's like, picture the scene. It's like, oh, daddy, I'm really hungry. Can I have a fish? Yes, of course you can. You know, it's just like, okay. And then, oh, daddy, can I have a, can I have a bit of bread? Yeah, okay, here you go. Thud. And then just walking off, it's like, it's a comical picture and Jesus is like what father among you would ever do this verse 13 if you then who are evil right if you who are flawed even on your best days you're going to struggle to love your kids or love others well know how to give good gifts to your children how much more how much more will the heavenly father give the holy spirit to those who ask him God is not a father who is out to trick you. God is not a father who is out to just teach you harsh lessons. He is a generous father. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Do you know that? Every good thing you have in your life has been given to you by God, whether you recognize it or not, whether you ask for it or not. It is all a good gift of his grace, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Friends, we need to believe that God only gives good gifts. And I think we struggle to believe that. Because I think we look at our life experiences and the things that are difficult and the things that we have to endure and, we, and suffer and go, how on earth can this be a good gift? But the reality is, the scripture is clear that God only gives good gifts. That he works all things together yeah, for our good. That he is a father. Now, you, even as I'm saying this, some of you probably internally are squirming and going, I can't quite... Can't quite process this, doesn't match up with my experience. Okay, but the alternative is that God sends you curses. Right? That's the alternative. He either sends you good things, gives you good things, or he's a father that gives you bad things and sends you curses. And and our faith, okay, rests upon the fact that Jesus became the curse for us on the cross. That all of the just judgment and punishment for our wrongdoing was placed upon him and that we have died with him and been raised with him and are seated with him. Let me ask you another question. Does the father ever give the son <laughs> curses? Or is his heart only good and loving towards the son? And we are in the son. So God only gives us good things. Now, of course, I'm sure part of our response when we hear that is, but then why, didn't, why did this happen? Or why, when I asked for this, did God not answer? Or why am I having to experience this? And I've asked God loads to take it away, and I can't see in any way, shape, or form how that could be for my good. Now, I don't want to brush those questions aside. Those are valid questions. Those are real questions. And they are questions without simple answers. They are questions that carry with them frustrating levels of mystery. And we wrestle with those things. But as we wrestle with those things, I would encourage us to hold on to what we know, yeah, rather than build a faith or prayer approach based upon what we don't know. Because that's often what we do. We allow those questions to become our starting place when it comes to praying and asking God for things rather than allowing the promises of God to become our starting place and submitting those mysteries to him. We put our confidence in the things that we do know, the things that scripture tells us about God. And we go, I don't understand how all the other stuff fits in. 
but I'm going to trust that God is everything that he says he is. And so therefore, I'm going to start there and I'm going to ask in faith rather than allow my asking to be robbed from me because of the things that I don't understand in my finite and limited mind. And part of this, the struggle is that most of us, I think, trust God ultimately, but we don't trust him immediately. Yeah? So we trust God generally with the whole of our lives, and we trust God to keep the world spinning, you know, and to keep the sun in the sky, and we trust him with those eternal, those eternal matters, but we don't trust him with the immediate, with the day to day. Those are the things that we kind of say, look, I trust you to keep hold of this, but I'm going to keep hold of this. You can keep the big things, God, but I'm going to keep the small things. And yet, the simple prayer is, give us our daily bread. And that simple prayer, if we make it a habit, weans us off of our independence. Yeah, it weans us off of our independence. Asking prayer replaces our pursuit of control with trust in God. And it helps us to surrender to him and to surrender to his way. Because James warns us about asking with the wrong heart. He says in James chapter 4, verse 2 to 3, You desire and do not have, so you murder. You cover and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. I think one of our challenges with asking God for things is that sometimes we ask in a way that, that we're attempting essentially to bend God's will to ours. Yeah? And then we get frustrated when God doesn't, doesn't answer in the way that we want to. And our asking is very much about what, what we want more than about what God wants. I think we have to recognize how Jesus starts this prayer. Yeah? In what context does he instruct us to ask God for things? It comes straight after, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Then give us, but, but you first. Your kingdom come, then give us. So our requests come in the context of surrender. Our requests come in the context of the prayer of like, your kingdom come, not my kingdom come. So we're asking in submission to God's will, not just asking for our own will. And I believe that we become bold askers yeah, when we tune our hearts into God's purposes. We become confident askers when we tune our prayers into the things that God has on his heart to do. Eugene Peterson says this, God is always doing something before I know it. Yeah? He's always working. So his action and his working is not primarily instigated because of our prayers. He's working before we even pray. So the task, Eugene Peterson says, is not to get God to do something I think needs to be done, but to become aware of what God is doing so that I can respond to it, participate in it, and take delight in it. Yeah? Does that make sense? So he's saying you tune in to God's heart. You tune in to God's purposes. You come surrendered to his will. You hear what it is that he wants to do. You pray in response to what God's already doing. And then you're asking with boldness and with confidence for him to work. And your response to that might be, well, doesn't that make our asking pointless? Isn't God just going to do it anyway then? Yeah, if he's always moving and we're only asking for the things that God wants to do, doesn't that make prayer pointless? Well, to quote another guy called Andrew Murray, he says this, let Christians awake and hear the message. Your prayer can obtain what otherwise would be withheld, can accomplish what otherwise remains undone. I really believe that there are things that God wants to give us and do for us and do through us that he will only do if we ask. That actually he has ordained those things to come to pass through the prayers of his people. And if we, are, if we do not ask, we will not receive those things. In Mark chapter 10, and I'll share this as I finish, 
We have the story of blind Bartimaeus sitting on the road and Jesus walks past and Bartimaeus cries out to him to get Jesus' attention. And Jesus comes up to him and it's very obvious what Bartimaeus' need is. Okay, And Jesus says something very interesting to him. He comes up to him and he says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? He knows <laughs> what blind Bartimaeus wants him to do for him. And yet he wants him to ask. And had blind Bartimaeus not asked, not said, Let, I want to recover my sight, had he, had he not said anything, had he been too worried about being disappointed and so just kind of hesitated and said, no, actually, I'm okay. Let me ask you, do you think Jesus would have healed him anyway? I have no idea. <laughs> but there's a possibility he wouldn't have. Because he said to him explicitly, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus responded, and Jesus gave him what he asked for. And I believe that is the same invitation extended to us. That Jesus is saying to us, what do you want me to do for you? How would you answer that question today? That's what I want to leave you with. How would you ask, answer that question? What would you ask for? What is on the Father's heart for you today? What will you risk being disappointed about? if you don't get the answer you're looking for and have to wrestle in a deep way about God's goodness and sovereignty and your trust in him no matter what happens? What will you risk to take you into a deeper place of intimacy with the Father and a deeper faith? Yes, you'll experience some disappointments if you go on the adventure of asking God, but you'll also experience some great celebrations and God begins to do more than we can ask or imagine. And so I just want to finish with a Spurgeon quote. He says this, If you may have everything by asking, and nothing without asking, I beg you to see how absolutely vital prayer is, and I beseech you to abound in it. Church, what could God do among us and through us if we were to commit ourselves to asking? What are the dreams and visions and prayers in your heart for the people that you want to see come to know him, that you know you've kind of just let lying on the floor because of disappointment or disillusion or whatever that we haven't persevered with? Or the things, the little things that God has dropped into our heart that we were then too worried about picking those things up and presenting them back to God and saying, I, I think you're saying this, could I, could I dare to ask you? My prayer for us is that in this next season, God would help us to recapture that sense of his heart for us. To let him be God, to let, let go of our control and to respond in faith to his question, what do you want me to do for you? Shall we stand to our feet?